What do Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Mussolini and Hitler all have in common? They're all scared of cats. <laughs> Seriously. And I like to think that since Alexander came before all the others, they were all just copying Alexander. And if, if you think about it like an anime, then Alexander the Great is Goku, and Caesar, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, and the rest are like Luffy, Naruto, Ichigo, and them, you know? Conquerors in their own right, but Alexander did it first. I think... I'm officially the first person ever to compare Alexander the Great to Goku and Napoleon to Naruto, but it serves to set the stage and give you an idea of how important Alexander was to world history. Also, the comparison, I mean, it kind of makes sense because all these all these anime characters and all these conquerors, they share massive dreams and ambitions. I mean, now that I think about it, there's a dark side to all this goodness in Luffy and Naruto and Goku. Anyway. Let's talk about this Alex guy, who conquered half the known world by the time he was 30. I'm 33. Yeah, so I feel a certain way about this one. Let's do this. Alexander's story starts before Alexander's story actually starts. Yeah, it's like I tried to sound deep with that one. I, I, I really, I really didn't. Like, it starts with King Philip II, Alexander's dad, who was a great conqueror in his own right. Not to beat you over the head with anime comparisons, but think of it like Naruto and the Fourth Hokage. Before Alexander became the great, his dad Philip was the man. The year is three. 59 BCE, and Philip was king of Macedonia at a time when the Greek Empire was crumbling. Athens and Sparta had united to fight off the mighty Persian Empire on the back of 300 men with fake abs and red speedos. But that war left the powerful Greek realm depleted, and a depleted realm is a realm in chaos, and a realm in chaos is a ladder. So there was a lot of infighting over the future of the Greek Empire, and one of the challengers was Philip II, king of Macedonia, aka a king who was majorly disrespected by the likes of Athens because Macedonia was considered some backwater hole. But might as well keep going with the anime comparisons. Many anime have taught us that people from backwater holes can accomplish great things and Philip was on his main character energy for real and beat up the Greek nations who were now just a bunch of philosophy nerds not ready to fight Chad Philip. So before long, the backwater king who had ruled over this now ruled over all of this. Of course, it takes more than chat genes to beat up philosophy nerds, and Philip was actually a military genius. Flexible formations, ridiculously 20 foot long spears, elite troops that operate independently from regular troops. It sounds normal now, but those were all innovations that King Philip II introduced to warfare at the time, along with perfecting things he had learned from the Greeks, like the famous phalanx formation. In combat, Philip was just on a different level, and little by little, spanking by spanking, he took over Greece. Meanwhile, a different kind of spanking, the kind that comes with some hair pulling, you know, some hot wax and that, that led to the birth of Philip's son, Alexander. Alexander was born to one of Philip's seven wives, Olympias, who was not from Macedonia, she was Greek. Yeah, I wonder if that's going to be important later on in the video, if I'm just pointing out that she was Greek right now. The inherited Chad genes were strong in young Alexander, so Philip had high hopes that his son would one day become the legendary Super Saiyan that conquers the enemy lands, aka the Persian Empire. And by the age of 10, Alexander delivered on that potential when a horse salesman visited his father. And I swear to God, I'm glad I started with all these anime parallels because this real life story could not be more anime if you tried let's switch up the artwork for this one actually let's switch up the artwork a horse salesman came to philip's palace in order to do what horse salesmen do best sell horses the one horse in particular stood out but not because it was one the king wanted to buy but because it was an extra wild stallion massive powerful and wild beyond imagination so wild that no one could come near it 
but just tame it. And as for writing it, <laughs> forget about it. No one, not Philip, not his soldiers, not his generals, nobody. It was clear that this stallion, however powerful, however incredible, was out of control. So, not nah, thanks, we don't want it. <laughs> Two guesses what young, 10 year old Alexander said. I got this. This 10 year old was on some serious Gohan cell saga energy, got on that horse and he tamed it. Tamed it and named it. Wukefalas. A horse that from this day on would stay by Alexander's side throughout many battles for 30 years until he died of old age. Bro, if this happened in an anime, we'd all be like, yeah, <laughs> right? But. Welcome to the life of Alexander the Great, a real life anime. And this is just the beginning, and I'm not even saying that to sound cool, nah, literally, this is the beginning, because his dad was so proud of Alexander that he cried tears and told his son, my boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions, Macedon is too small for you. This could have been a real Mufasa teaching moment if Philip had said that Alexander would rule over everything he already rules, but Philip just had to go and say, you need a bigger kingdom. He just had to go and rile the boy up. So instead of turning Alexander into Simba, my guy turned Alexander into Scarface. Me, I want what's coming to me. Oh, well, what's coming to you, Tommy? The world, Chico. And everything in it. And his dad was poised to give it to him. King Philip got him the best tutors, best trainers, best swordsmen, best horsemen, all of them to teach the young Alexander. And by the time he was 13, he got him the Don Dada himself to take over Alexander's education. The Don Dada, Aristoteles. Religion, morals, philosophy, art, logic, Aristoteles taught Alexander everything. And Alexander's warrior trainers stealed the boy's physical body and bro, listen. I wasn't kidding when I said King Philip was prepping his son to go Super Saiyan. Alexander was crafted to be a god amongst men. And that's probably why Alexander literally saw himself as a god amongst men. At the worst of times, Alexander thought he was a reincarnation of Achilles. And at the best of times, Alexander thought he was straight up a son of Zeus. So of course, Alexander's Sweet 16 was a little different than what we're used to today. King Philip celebrated his boy's birthday by leaving him in charge of the empire. In 340 BCE, the king had to go off on yet another war campaign to grow their realm. And while he was gone, all of this was left in Alexander's care. And this is where we have unrealistic Alexander real life anime moment number two. Let's switch up the artwork again, all right? Mm -hmm. With a massive territory come a lot of conquered people who are not really feeling their overlords. One of those people was the Thracian tribe Medi. They knew that they could never defeat Philip's military genius, but with 16-year-old Alexander in charge, they went into open rebellion because these grown men felt pretty good about bullying a teenager and were certain that they could defeat him. Or so they thought. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, y'all, we're talking about a guy whose nickname would later be The Great. <laughs> Once Alexander heard of the rebellion, he took his army into the rebels' hometown, killed everybody that didn't run away fast enough, and then sold the rest in slavery, took over the city, and named it Alexandropoli. <laughs> Bro, he named the city after himself. I mean, come on. Table? Meat? <clears throat> Meat. You get me. You know in anime and manga when geniuses already have ridiculous feats when they're super young just so it's established that they're special? Yeah, that was literally Alexander. So King Philip returned from his campaign only to find out his son had not just beaten down a revolt but also named the city after himself. Papa King was proud and impressed, so impressed that he gave his teenage son his own army to beat down more revolts and uprisings all over the empire. I mean, Alexander was 16. When I was 16, my dad increased my pocket money to like 50 euro. It was a big day for me. 
teenage Alexander was not just a token army leader neither, nah man. He literally joined his father on war campaigns and was a vital part in a crucial battle against Athens and other Greek powers for the future of Greece, a battle that Philip and Alexander won to finally unify Greece under King Philip II leadership in 338 BC. And I just want to throw this out there that I feel like conquering lands with your dad is like the best father-son bonding time ever. I mean, I love playing basketball with my dad and thank you, Papa, for showing up to all my games. But, you know, every once in a while it would have been cool if we like would have conquered at least a village at least a farm, you know, something. Anyway, you'd think son and father that conquered together stayed together, but they didn't. After King Philip II was done unifying Greece, he and the newly unified empire set their sights on settling an old score. They wanted to defeat the Persian Empire. So naturally, Philip was off on war campaigns and distant lands from time to time and left Alexander in charge of Greece and eventually in 337 BCE King Philip II returned with a new wife Cleopatra. Cleopatra Eurydice. <laughs> yeah. it, it's not the Cleopatra. It's, it's basically Walmart Cleopatra. I mean, the name was common at the time. But hey, that was a good moment. You know, it's like, ooh, ooh Cleopatra. Oh, I didn't think she would be in the story. Nah, man, she's not. This is a common name. It's anyway, Walmart Cleopatra was actually full Macedonian. And if you've been paying attention, this should make you go, damn. I'm sorry. Told you it was going to be important that Alexander's mom was Greek. It meant that now with fully Macedonian Cleopatra as his wife, Alexander's position as heir to the empire was absolutely not secure. Not Ramsay Bolton levels of insecure, but insecure still. So at this point, Alexander is questioning the whole padromance he was building up with his padre. At this point, Alexander is thinking that Philip wants to have a son with warmer Cleopatra and that their son will then inherit the throne. So at the wedding feast, the proverbial poo-poo hit the fan. Walmart Cleopatra's uncle got so drunk that he started talking about how the new couple should go and produce a son, like right now, ideally with him watching. And Alexander took offense to that. He threw his cup at the uncle and said, you perverted villain, what am I then? <laughs> Bastard. And then Alexander Snow left his father's empire with his mother and set up shop in another country that belonged to his father's empire. <laughs> it's like a rich kid running away from the family mansion to be independent, living in the family beach house. But hey, I, what can you do when you helped your dad conquer all? And while Alexander was away from his dad, King Philip II actually sent an envoy to Alexander to let him know that he never meant to replace him. He actually wanted Alexander as his heir. And so Alexander returned. And I feel like this whole thing could have just been settled with a simple, a simple communication before it escalated. So that's your sign to call your dad or your mom today and clear whatever tension there might be between you because, you know, Right after all of that went down, uh, Philip died. Yeah, 336 BCE, King Philip was assassinated by his own king's guard. To this day, we don't know why exactly, but it's not exactly rocket science why people assassinate kings. So even non-rocket scientist heir to the throne, Alexander was like, ah shit, I think I'm next. At 20 years young, Alexander was heir to the vacant throne and he was shook because he knew a show of power would be necessary to scare off any would-be assassins and actually take and keep the throne. So he had a couple important people and relatives killed. And remember, remember the drunk uncle, Walmart Cleopatra's drunk uncle from the wedding? Yeah, he killed him too, just in case. And you know when you get excited and your dog gets excited too and is down with like whatever you're excited about, like I could do this right now and you'd be like, yeah, party. Well, well, that bad part. It wasn't the script that he was going to get excited. He just got scared. <laughs> but hey, sometimes get excited with you, you know, and they get on with whatever you do. It's like, yeah. 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 that 
was literally Alexander's mom right now. Alexander's energy got her super excited. And she was like, ah, yeah, let's get some bitches. <laughs> she killed Woma, Cleopatra, and her daughter, and her son. And then in her excitement of just poisoning people, she poisoned other people, but she botched the poisoning of those other people. So she just left some people mentally or physically crippled for the rest of their lives. Good job, mom. But at least Walmart, Cleopatra, and the two children, and a couple of other people were dead or physically or mentally disabled. Anyway, Alexander and his mom have made a clear statement. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. Of course, some people in distant regions of the kingdom still revolted over the next couple of years, but Alexander put those revolts down in style. He marched his army into the rebels' front yards and had his troops do drills to show how disciplined and badass they were in their shiny armor and awesome swords and pointy big spears and the rebels were looking at their pitchforks like... Yeah, I think this was a bad idea to begin with. <laughs> Alexander, right? How do you feel about the nickname? The Great. One might be tempted to say that Alexander is a trust fund baby who just inherited his father's greatness. But Alexander was more than that. Alexander improved upon everything his father had built. Philip's army was already revolutionary in its usage of elite troops, cavalry, formation tactics and flexibility. But Alexander took it to a how never. Level. Alexander's army was super diverse, with many units operating at different speeds, but all within one massive army. Light and heavy cavalry, light and heavy infantry, spearmen with 20-foot spears, others with javelins, archers, slingers, elite troops, one of which was led by Alexander personally. Alexander took his dad's model and supersized it. It was impossible to prep for this army and even harder to fight it. Add to that the insane respect Alexander commanded and the absolute discipline he instilled in his troops. And yeah, Alexander's dudes were a wrecking ball. A, flex a flexible wrecking ball. Like, I think like Miley Cyrus, who seems to be very flexible. <laughs> Uh, what am I? Everything I listed doesn't sound like much now, but at the time, this type of army was super duper revolutionary and was no problem for Alexander to keep Greece under his control. Even though the Greeks weren't exactly thrilled to be ruled by another Macedonian, since they never accepted Macedonia as a part of Greek or Macedonians as Greeks rather and also didn't like Alexander's king-like behavior but what can you do when a guy slaps the crap out of whoever speaks up against him and I don't mean that as a figure of speech either when the uprisings all over Greece because it was a big empire were becoming too annoying for Alexander just because you know, they pop up wherever he was and like whack-a-mole. Alexander decided that he had to set an example. The next uprising would be completely destroyed. And that was Theba, better known as Thebes. They revolted and they were completely destroyed. Alexander leveled the city and then created smaller cities in its stead and populated them with the surrounding people. And that message, that fear, kept everybody in line. Alexander's rule over unified Greece was now cemented and unquestioned and so Alexander could finally focus on bigger, better things. Specifically, one thing his father had set in motion but never managed to accomplish, conquer the Persian Empire. And just so you understand the level of ambition that this had to it, this was Alexander's empire at this time and this was Persia. There's a reason many call Alexander's campaign in Persia the greatest military campaign of all time and it started in 334 BCE when Alexander took 48,000 men from all over Greece and marched his army across the Hellespont into Persian territory and you have to know that Alexander was the kind of commander that's not sitting back 
at the war camp just looking pretty nah man alexander was the kind of commander that literally charged i mean he loved the tales of achilles he adored the iliad which is funny because that's like the anime or manga of the time so it's like us really thinking we're goku alexander was just like that he thought he was that dude so he fashioned himself after the greatest hero of the time achilles and he charged into that first battle against the Persians, like. <laughs> and then he was almost killed. <laughs> I mean, it's true, but it doesn't make him any less epic. He was almost killed, but he lived and killed many Persians at this battle of the Granicus River. More than that, he proved his brilliance as a commander, once again as a strategist in a seriously one-sided battle. 400 Greeks died in that battle versus 4,000 dead Persians. What's more, the Persians had several thousand Greek mercenaries fighting for their side. And after the battle, you might think that now Alexander would be like, hey, brethren, join us. We'll both serve his numbers with his kin. But nah, Alexander executed half of them for being traitors and enslaved the rest. Damn it. Next, Alexander and his army traveled down the Persian coast and declared each city to now finally be free of the Persians. AKA, we're actually kind of conquering you, but Aristoteles told me it sounds better if I'm telling you that I'm granting you your freedom. Um, so, yay, go on, um, be free. Oh, I'll kill you and burn your city. On and on down the coast, Alexander went, taking over all the port cities as a strategic first move to ensure that the Persians could not dock their boats at any of these ports and attack Alexander from behind as he travels inwards. Ironic, since he admired Achilles and rumor has it that Achilles did enjoy being attacked from behind. <laughs> Okay, what, what, what am I doing? First the wrecking ball, no, this is... Alexander kept sweeping along the coastline, winning every battle, kept on conquering, kept on liberating cities, and he was just basically like someone coming into your home and telling you, hey, you keep doing what you do, you're awesome, do, keep doing what you do exactly as you are, just put pictures of me up everywhere and post about me on your socials three times a week, or I'll kill you. It's like, okay, that's not too bad as far as being conquered goes, but what the fuck? So with that strategy, Alexander eventually got to the island of Sur in 332 BC, an island one mile off the coast. And Sur was like, hey bro, we heard you're out there liberating a bunch of folks. <laughs> We're good. Uh, we're feeling pretty liberated already. Life's good. So thanks, but no thanks. But Alexander told them, I think you really should consider being liberated by me. I, I have no bad intentions. <laughs> you know, I'm, I literally just bring freedom. So just gonna build this bridge across the water right here to deliver that freedom to your city. Ah, uh, you know, we really don't need a bridge right here, right now. As we said, feeling the liberty already. <laughs> so let me just destroy your bridge. <laughs> Cause you know, already feel pretty liberated. Okay. I hear you, I'm just gonna build a new bridge. There we go, you know, just gonna send some liberation ships too. You're gonna love it. <laughs> ah, the good old liberation ships with siege weapons on them. <laughs> no thanks. So the city of Sur literally threw rocks in the water to stop the ships, but Alexander kept sending his liberation army and finally, after eight months, the city of Sur was liberated. To be exact, 10,000 men were liberated into the afterlife and 30,000 men, women and children were liberated into slavery. After the liberation of Sur, the other cities were so excited about Alexander's liberation army that they didn't even fight against him, except one place that still resisted. Gaza. Yep. <laughs> the Gaza. Talk about a place that cannot catch a break. Back then, Gaza was another siege for Alexander, and his punishment for resisting his gift of liberty, Alexander and his army killed all the city's men and sold all the women and children into slavery. And then Alexander forced the local governor Batis to kneel before him, and when Batis refused to do that, Alexander tied him to a chariot by his ankles and dragged him around the rocky streets of Gaza 
until Batiste was dead and continued to drag him along long after. Damn. Remember how I told you Alexander thought he was Achilles? Yeah, I meant that. Because that's literally what Achilles did to Hector. Obviously, Alexander kept on conquering, and even country borders couldn't stop him. So while he was at it, he figured, what the hell, might as well liberate Egypt too. And still in 332 BCE, Alexander and his army hopped on over to Egypt to do just that. Funny thing is, Egypt actually felt liberated. They actually welcomed Alexander, they had an oracle proclaim him the son of Zeus, and Egypt crowned him literally crowned him as pharaoh. They loved him, and he loved them. Alexander had mad respect for the Egyptian traditions, culture, history. It was a, it was a whole love story up in there between Egypt and Alexander the Great. Pharaoh Alexander the Great. So as far as Egypt was concerned, yeah, that was easy. How about that? At this point, Alexander's territory had grown from this to this. And after Egypt, Alexander went back to get himself some more Persian land. So of course the Persians at this point really had to do something. And their first move was to offer Alexander peace terms. And Persian king Darius sent Alexander a letter. A letter that read, Keep the lands to the west of the Euphrates River and we're good. I mean, hell. Let's co rule. Marry one of my daughters. What the heck? Our empire was a little too big for us anyway. So you, you can have all that. West west of the river, all right? Just leave me alone. East of it. Cool. I'll give you a lot of money too, okay? It's just fuck off. And if you don't, we'll hit you with the full might of Persia. Again, this is Alexander's empire at this point, And this is Persia. That's a 155-pound lightweight fighting against a 260 pound heavyweight. This was in 331 BCE, and it should be noted that Alexander was still only 25 at the time, but being a smart young man, taught by Aristoteles, he knew to surround himself with wiser older men, and one of those wiser older men was his father's former commander, Parmenion, who was now also a commander at Alexander's side. 40 years older than young Alexander, a man of impeccable judgment and experience, and his advice to Alexander was, if I were Alexander, I should accept what was offered and make a treaty. And 25-year-old Alexander said, so should I, if I were Parmenion. <laughs> Honestly, all Alexander really needed to know was how many men the Persians have. So he asked them, Yo, full might of Persia, huh? Was that like 100,000 men, 150? What are we talking, huh? Well, Alexander, we're gonna attack you with 250. It doesn't matter how many men you attack me with! So, Persia triggered. It should be noted though, at this point, there was also trouble in Alexander's camp. Alexander started to feel less like Alexander the Great and more like Alexander the Grandiose. If anything, Egypt's reaction and him being told by the oracle that he is the son of Zeus just went straight to his already big head. And Alexander's men were like, bro, like, first of all, stop this son of Zeus crap. We literally know your dad. It's Philip, bro. And also, king of Greece, Shah of Persia, pharaoh of Egypt, what are we doing? That's, that's so much. But in his endless ambition, Alexander was deaf to the first rumblings of unrest in his own army. He was too excited by all the new lands he conquered and their exotic ways and cultures. Actually, Alexander was not just excited by it. Hell, I love you! Alexander fell completely in love with Persia. And mind you, this started as a hateful war campaign, a hateful war campaign to take the Persians down, not to have respect for their culture. And in Egypt, Alexander even founded a city, Alexandria, and he was all loved. And in Persia, he took wives, fathered children, adopted the Persian customs. So depending on which side you stand on, Alexander was either becoming a benevolent ruler that transcended cultural division, or he had lost his way and was a traitor to his own people and to most of his army 
his men, Alexander was a traitor to his own people, and he lost a lot of respect, especially when he had his Greek generals married to Persian women and included Persian soldiers in his own army and even promoted them to lead Greek troops. His love for Persia was too big and the greatness of his campaign was beginning to unravel. Just out of Greek pride though, and out of loyalty, they still wanted to see the conquest of Persia through to the end. And the final battle was upon us. Alexander and his men faced off against the full might of Persia. 47,000 versus 250,000. The battle of Gargamel. Despite his men being unhappy with his personal decisions, Alexander was still the greatest military mind they knew. So they followed him into this battle to finish what they started against ridiculously overwhelming numbers. Some historians even like to exaggerate the numbers to say that Alexander the Great and his roughly 47,000 men faced off against 500,000 Persians. We don't know for sure what the number was, but whatever the case, even Alexander's advisors told him this would be impossible and he should not fight the Persians in a fair battle. But Alexander didn't listen to them. Then wise, old, brave, experienced Parmenion spoke up again and suggested Alexander should attack the Persians at night, take them by surprise. But Alexander looked at him and said, Cowards do that and that ain't you! You're better than that! So Alexander faced the Persian army that outnumbered him at least five to one, head on, in a fair battle, and he won. 47,000 Greeks defeated 250,000 or more Persians. The Persian army, in fact, wasn't as much defeated physically as they were defeated mentally. The Persian king Darius was tired of being embarrassed by Alexander over and over, so in this battle, he led the charge against Alexander and his troops. And Darius' troops charged with chariots and heavy cavalry. Alexander was expecting this and used his light-footed archers to piece the cavalry apart with arrows. And when what remained of the chariot assault closed in, Alexander's troops simply opened their ranks, let the Persians in, trapped them and slaughtered them. Darius' own chariot was also downed, so the king fled the battle on horseback, and at the sight of their cowardly king abandoning them, the Persian troops were done. Of course, there is much more detail to this battle, and I'm, I'm simplifying, but that was the crucial tactic that ultimately led to the one thing that's really important here. Against impossible odds, Alexander won the battle. He had conquered Persia. The man who ruled of an empire of this size now commanded an empire of this size. After entering Persia with some 40,000 men, Alexander the Great now ruled over half the known world at just 25 years of age. But conquering Persia was the beginning of Alexander's downfall. The command over his men was once Alexander's biggest strength. He fought with them. He shared his spoils with them. They loved him for it. As much as he was their ruler, Alexander was one of them. But even though he was one of them, Alexander failed to see that his ambition was simply on a different level than everybody else's. After eight years on a war campaign, his men wanted to see their families. They wanted to actually enjoy their spoils of war and not eventually die in an endless conquest. What was the point of all this conquering if there is no end to it? Conquering Persia made sense to settle an old score for the pride of Greece, but now Alexander wanted to conquer India too? A whole new realm? There was one lesson Aristoteles and Philip failed to teach Alexander. The guys who last in this business are the guys who fly straight. 
low key, quiet. And the guys who want it all, Chicas champagne, flash. They don't last. Still, Alexander managed to convince his troops to attack India and he might have just been able to convince them to conquer India with him if it wasn't for the fact that in his first battle against the Indian ruler King Poros in 326 BCE, Alexander lost more men than in his entire Persian and Egyptian campaigns combined. This was the last straw, fighting against a ferocious new enemy that employed war elephants in a foreign territory, a foreign climate, further away from home than ever, with a higher chance to die than ever, all for an Alexander that had bought into Persian customs and cozied up with the enemy. This wasn't the men his men believed in anymore, not the man they wanted to put their lives on the line for. Alexander wanted the world, but his men wanted their home. So this was the end of it. Alexander's men refused to go further and Alexander had to accept it. Not defeat on the battlefield because he never lost a single battle there, but defeat in commanding and inspiring the men he fought alongside with. Alexander had to promise to finally march them home all the way back through Persia. And then on their way home Alexander was like, Hey, but why we on our way through Persia already? You know, let's end some rebellions here and there and conquer everywhere we forgot to conquer on the way here. How are you, you feeling about that? Everybody raise their hand and thinks that's a good idea. And it is then that Alexander died. Not exactly right as he said that they didn't tear him apart on the spot. Alexander died on his way back to Greece through Persia. He died in Babylon in 323 BCE and we actually don't know how exactly he died but it sure is some convenient timing that he died while marching frustrated troops home, the long way home. Frustrated troops kind of considered him a traitor at this point. Does that mean they killed him? No, but it's possible. But what we can be certain of is that Alexander died of some form of poisoning alcohol, a disease, or the good old-fashioned killer crazy ruler type of poisoning, we don't know. All we do know is that Alexander the Great died at age 32, 13 years after he inherited this empire from his father. Alexander the Great died while in charge of this empire. I'm just saying, he was 32. I'm 33, and I'm barely in charge of this guy. Now, I love you though. <laughs> and on the next episode of Blood, the Period of Conquerors, Julius Caesar, the man who laid the foundation for the Roman Empire with a name so powerful that it was adopted by every Roman emperor and many rulers outside of Rome long after his death. Caesar was that dude. The original people's champ loved by the millions of Julius Caesar fans around the Roman Republic. But if you somehow have this image of Caesar, as an old guy, let me tell you that this dude often fought on the front lines and was once kidnapped by pirates and went more Rambo on them than Rambo ever went on anyone. And also, Caesar was a dog. I mean, that man was a dog. 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 Caesar put the play in playboy. That man slept with many of his rival senators' wives and word on the Roman streets was that even men weren't safe from Tezza's appetite. Dog, he's a straight <laughs> D-A-W-G. So let's do a biography on Gaius Julius Caesar, whose great life ended with him being murdered by a man who may or may not have been Caesar's own son. Let's do this.
Gaius Julius Caesar was born on July 12th or 13th in 100 BCE. So long ago that back then July was actually called Quintilis and it was only due to and after Julius Caesar that the month was renamed July in his honor. Caesar was born to a father who went by the same name, Gaius Julius Caesar, I guess now we will say senior, if you will, and his wife Aurelia. His father was governor and his mother came from a noble family, but the real big dong energy in Caesar's family tree was packed by his aunt Julia and her husband Caesar's uncle Gaius Marius the Older. And the two of them squared that big dong energy in their marriage and passed it on to their son who shared his father's name and became known as Gaius Marius the Younger. And Gaius Marius the Younger was the man at the time. Dude was a warrior, badass, turned great commander, a real jabroni beating. Pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, talking is done, you're out of your class, no sleep till Brooklyn, the rock whips you. He was the people's champ. And at this point in time, the people of the Roman Republic needed a champ because the Republic was failing. Nope that this was not the famous Roman Empire ruled by an emperor yet. At the time, it was ruled by two selected consuls and the Roman Senate. But the existing power structure in the Roman Republic favored conservative aristocrats and their interests, aka money, outweighed the interests of the common folk and outweighed the interests of the soldiers who conquered the vast lands of the Roman Republic in the first place but were now cast aside after their service was up with no pay and no lands. So the people were pissed and that anger gave rise to the Popularis party previously led by Gaius Marius the Older, Caesar's uncle, but now led by Gaius Marius the Younger, Caesar's cousin who was dead set on finishing a civil war his father had started against the Roman aristocrats known as the Optimates party at the time led by a name called Lucius Cornelius Sulla. A civil war to redistribute the wealth across Rome was about to ensue. A civil war that was an epic clash that shook the Roman Republic and its traditional values to their core. Optimates versus Popularis, the aristocracy versus the people, Sulla versus Gaius, Marius, the younger, the jabroni beating. Ow! Pie eating, heart stopping, elbow dropping. People's yeah, Jabroni beating Gaius lost against Sulla and committed suicide in 82 BCE. So that was that. The Popularis lost. And for all the members of the Popularis, this defeat was pretty bad news because with Sulla being victorious, he now seized full power and was dictator of Rome. And the first thing Sulla announced was the purge. Seriously, all members of the Popularis and their supporters were now fair game. No law, you could literally go American History X on them and you would even be rewarded for it. Enter 19 year old Gaius Julius Caesar. The young Caesar was a known supporter of the Popularis and married to the daughter of a leading member of the Popularis party. He was married to Cornelia. So Caesar was high up on the purge list with half of Rome basically ready to curb stomp him, which is why young Caesar decided to nope the hell out of Rome and enlisted in the military where he was safe from the purge and where he kind of was the rookie of the year. Turns out the well-educated and well-spoken young Caesar was really good at the soldier thing and right off the bat he was a part of successful campaigns in Asia and Cilicia, rose through the ranks and eventually in 80 BC at just 20 years young, a year after enrolling, Caesar was sent on a special mission. 
His troops were locked in a battle, and to tilt that stalemate in their favor, the general asked Caesar to get the old forgetful king Nicomedes to send the allied fleet of ships he had promised the Romans in support. Caesar was successful in soliciting that allied fleet from the king, but he spent so much time at the king's court that rumor began to spread that he also solicited a different fleet from the old king. <laughs> if you catch my drift. Actually, I don't know if that drift makes any sense. Solicit a different fleet? No. Basically, rumor had it that Caesar was the old king's lover, but hey. Man, everyone's gay once in a while. So basically, the young soldier Julius Caesar was good at handling all kinds of swords. And while he was out doing all that sword handling, back in Rome, Sulla died in 78 BC. The dictator was dead, which meant that Rome was safe again. And after three years away, Julius Caesar returned to Rome that same year, only to find out that while he was gone, Sulla had confiscated all his inheritance, which meant Caesar was broke as hell. But Caesar had one very valuable skill he trained all throughout his life. He was a gifted speaker, well educated, studied in Greek philosophies and charming as hell. He had all the tools needed to succeed in Roman politics, which at the time were more of a popularity contest and an eloquence contest, even more so than politics today. So young Caesar got a foot in the door and things were going okay. So he decided to climb that ladder, you know, further his studies by traveling to Greece, further his philosophy to be better at the public speaking thing. But while he was on a ship in the Aegean Sea, young Julius Caesar, was kidnapped by pirates. Cilician pirates kidnapped 25-year-old Julius Caesar in 75 BCE. Of course, as most pirates were, these pirates were just after some booty. Yeah, booty, as in a rich gain or prize. And so they demanded 20 talents for Caesar's release. For reference, one talent at a modest conversion rate is at least $100,000 today. And these pirates demanded 20 talents. That's a lot of money. I'll leave it to you in the comments to work out just how much money exactly that is, but just know that at this staggering amount of a ransom money for his release, Caesar said, and this is really true, 20 talents, make it 50, I'm worth more than that. The pirates laughed at this young confident man, but my man doubled down and showed that he was serious saying, make it 50 talents and when you get the money and release me, I will come back and kill all of you. <laughs> so 50 talents it was and while they were waiting for the 50 talents for Caesar's release, Caesar used the time on the pirate ship to practice his rhetoric on the pirates. You know, he held speeches for them, recited poetry, threatened to kill them once he's free. The usual things you do when you're a hostage on a pirate ship. Honestly, as far as kidnappings go, not a bad time. Kind of sounds like he was kidnapped by the straw hat pirates equivalent of the time, like not the worst pirate crew to be stuck with. So when these fun pirates finally did get the 50 talents and Caesar was released, he did not forget the good times they had together. So he decided to round up his own crew of sailors, get a boat, set sail, hit the oceans and hunted down the pirates and had all of them crucified with their throats slit. Now Caesar was a free man again and a little bit of a legend because this story of how he hunted down the pirates, I mean that's epic now, 2000 years later. How baller do you think that was back then? Caesar was the man. Charming, alright looking, good looking even some say. Killer instinct, survivor, my guy was getting late, you know what I mean? Like come on, that's a story, you tell that at a bar over some drink, but you getting late. Sure, he was married, but man, don't forget, Cesar was a dog. 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 
Lord. And all he saw in Rome was a bunch of bones. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, getting into the details of his love life would blow the scope of this video. But just remember that Cesar had many, many, many lovers because this is going to be important later. Unfortunately, free legendary Cesar who hunted down the pirates was not entirely free to roam around Rome as he pleased. He was too skilled of a soldier, so he was recalled into the military to put down an uprising in Asia. And with the crucifixion of a bunch of pirates under his belt, Cesar was even more of a killer than ever before. And he was such a boss on that Asia campaign that he was called to that when he returned to Rome in 72, BCE after he took care of business, Caesar was appointed military tribune, which means he now had the right to command his own soldiers and run politically. And upon returning to Rome with all these epic stories and accomplishments under his belt, blessed with a silver tongue, man, Caesar was a rising star in the Roman Game of Thrones and his career took off. But Caesar never forgot his roots. Remember the Populares, the faction of the people formerly led by Caesar's role models, the father and son duo Gaius, Marius, the older and the younger, standing up for the common folk and the veterans, you remember, right? Just like Gaius, Marius, both of them. Caesar was a true man of the people, a military man that got down and dirty on the battlefield but could still go toe to toe and beyond with the lofty eloquence of the politicians. Caesar was the man the people needed. Those who felt belittled by the nobility felt seen and represented by Julius Caesar and could relate to him. And I don't want to go into the intricacies of the politics at the time. All you need to know is that Julius Caesar was openly embracing his role as the man of the people and fought for the ideologies of the populares, which meant good old Julius quickly became an enemy of the state, of the status quo. But still, Caesar had a post in the Senate, could claim military successes, Caesar was building a career in politics and his wife Cornelia was pregnant with their first child. His life is good, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then his wife Cornelia and the baby died during childbirth. A devastating blow to anyone and even the great Caesar was no exception to that. He was down and out. And you could argue that even though he was devastated by it, this was the beginning of his greatness. Shortly after his wife died, in 68 BCE, Caesar was called into service again to administrate the Roman territories in Spain. And while there, a grieving Caesar stumbled upon a statue of Alexander the Great. And at the sight of the man who had conquered half the known world at age 32, Caesar, who was also 32 at the time, contemplated his life and his shortcomings, fell to his knees at the feet of the statue and wept, swearing that one day Julius Caesar would be equal to or greater than Alexander the Great. With a new level of ambition unlocked, Caesar finished his job in Spain, you know, subduing a few local tribes who had the audacity to rebel against the Romans because, you know, how dare they be upset that we just come into their lands and take what's theirs and impose taxes and if they don't pay us taxes after we stole their land, we kill them. Like, how can they be upset? Caesar, do something about it. Caesar handled Rome's business, yet another victorious military campaign under his belt and returned to Rome with his sights set on becoming Pontifex Maximus. And if you're not a historian, that means absolutely nothing to you other than the fact that it sounds very cool. So let me explain what Pontifex Maximus actually means. 
is the top dog chief priest position in the Roman religion, and it had a bunch of duties like regulating the calendar, which was actually a thing back then, or supervising marriage, adoptions, wills, random stuff. But for Caesar, that position would have mostly just been a way to do favors for people in power and earn favors from people in power in return. Yeah, you, know, you scratch our backs, we'll scratch yours. Well, Jules, the funny thing about my back is, is that it's located on my cock. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a stepping stone on his rise to relevance. And so getting that position was important to him. So important that Cesar literally spent his fortune to beat out his competitors to secure the position of Pontifex Maximus. In fact, Cesar didn't just spend all of his fortune, he spent other people's money too. Money he borrowed in return for promises of doing them favors once he is appointed in the future. Cesar used the borrowed money to put on the most lavish election campaign because reminder, Roman politics were a popularity contest and Caesar played the game better than anyone. He spent money to put on gladiatorial events for the people, brought in exotic beasts to fight against these gladiators and all that coupled with his charm, his ability to speak, it won him the election. Easy. In 63 BCE, Caesar was officially appointed Pontifex Maximus. A broke ass Pontifex Maximus. Seriously in debt. Like, so seriously in debt that it's like when he hosted parties, bro was replacing the wine in those jugs with the cheap stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> We've all been there. Some of us are still there. So, yeah, Cesar was broke. And what do you do when you're broke as hell? You start an OnlyFans account. You align yourself with the richest man in Rome. And that's exactly what Caesar did. That rich man was Marcus Licinius Crassus. And Crassus wanted a couple of those favors. Caesar was now able to do for people in his new position as the high priest. You know, Crassus wanted a lot of favors. And then one day. And that day may never come. I'll call upon you to do a service for me. In return, Crassus paid off half of Caesar's debt. A perfect marriage of corruption. Of course, other powerful Romans noticed this Brome mans. <laughs> Brome mans. And one of them wanted to get in on the action too. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or just Pompey. Pompey was a military man, a respected general of serious status, so serious that he was literally nicknamed Pompey the Great. And he didn't really like Caesar's rise to fame all that much, but at the same time he knew that there was no stopping this guy. So Pompey went with the good old keep your enemies closer approach and also supported Caesar and Caesar played the same game marrying his daughter to old Pompey to make that alliance official. Some would say marrying off your only daughter for political gain is wrong. Others say he followed the pimp manual step by goddamn step. All of this played right into Caesar's hand because Caesar was not even remotely satisfied with just being some high priest. My guy was on that Alexander the Great quest, remember? Caesar had set his sights on becoming the consul of Rome, the highest position as far as ruling went within the Roman Republic. And with the support of the people, Crassus's money and Pompey's respect, that ambition was not all that ambitious. It was a foregone conclusion. In 59 BCE, Julius Caesar was elected co-consul of Rome alongside a man named Bibulus, who was basically the Robin to Caesar's Batman. If Robin was constantly told to shut the hell up by Batman for a few months until he gives up his spot and leaves Batman to do everything alone. That's what Caesar wanted. He was now the consul, the highest position there was, all thanks to the so-called triumvirate he had formed with Crassus and Pompey, the triangle of power between these three 
powerful men. And now Rome was as close to being under Caesar's control as ever. And as consul, Caesar was able to lay the foundation of eventually bringing Rome entirely under his control one day. He passed laws without consulting the Senate, laws like giving lands to veterans and other laws that more and more cemented him as the man of the people. Caesar also appointed friends and supporters in political positions and did plenty of favors for Pompey and Crassus so that anyone who opposed Caesar was automatically opposed by the soldiers Pompey had controlling the city and anyone who needed to be bought, well, thanks to Crassus' funding, Caesar had all the money to buy everybody who wanted. And all of this was super illegal, by the way. Like Caesar broke all the laws as a consul. And while you have immunity as a consul and are literally untouchable, a consulship only lasts for a year. After that, you can and will be tried for your crimes. And Caesar knew that, of course. So him, Pompey and Crassus, the triumvirate, the three men, they devised a plan. Once his term as consul was up, Caesar would be appointed governor of Gaul, a position that also comes with immunity a little bit outside of Rome, and the plan was that Caesar would govern and campaign in Gaul for 10 years until he is eligible to run for consul again and return. So once his consulship was officially up in 58 BCE, Caesar followed the plan, left on this new military campaign and again, not just to conquer for Rome, but to line his pockets and to avoid the prosecution he would have 100% faced had he stayed in Rome. So Caesar took four legions, which is roughly 40,000 soldiers, and decided that the people of Gaul don't really need their land all that much anyway and were ready to be conquered. How to Get Rich Quick, Gaul Edition by Julius Caesar. First, find the land that is divided and has a lot of kingdoms and tribes fighting against one another. Second, support one of the kings in return for letting you into said lands. Three, join forces and take down the common enemy tribe. Four, threaten the tribe that fought alongside you while they are weak from the battle. Five, force them to now fight for you and feed your army and pay taxes to you. Six, go to the next tribe. Seven, rinse and repeat. That's more or less how Caesar took over Gaul, tribe by tribe, region by region, and eventually, after almost five years, just five years, I should say, Julius Caesar had conquered all of Gaul, governed their land, collected their taxes, which made him stupid rich, and he even managed to invade Britain after he was done with Gaul. Britain, which at the time was an island few Romans had even heard of, but Caesar's military campaigns, they're well documented in many other videos, and that's not what I want to focus on. It will blow the scope of this videos. However, there's one aspect to his military campaigns, to his military side, that's important for you to understand in this video too. Caesar didn't win these battles with superior numbers. He was actually heavily outnumbered all throughout these campaigns. So. Let's just go into slight detail on one legendary battle to highlight Caesar's military genius and consider this example a very accurate depiction of the military mastermind Caesar was throughout his lifetime. The Battle of Alesia, 52 BCE. After Caesar and his troops conquered Gaul and were busy murdering and thieving in Britain against the will of the inhabitants, one of the Gaul leaders had the audacity to take back his homeland, Vercingetorix. Vercing Alright, I guess it's just... <laughs> I guess there's no dog for the rest of the video. I hope I got your attention. Man, if you turn off now... I am going to be thoroughly disappointed. 
and, and I'm, I'm just gonna I mean, that's the least you can do for the food and the drink anyway we were somewhere on the go this is unscripted <laughs> I'm, I'm not that back to the video <clears throat> One of the Gaul leaders, let's pull that picture back up, had the audacity to take back his homeland, Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix united some of the Gaul tribes and led successful attacks against the Roman invaders, which forced Caesar to abandon the British island and return to Gaul to face Vercingetorix in a battle for the future over the Gauls' homeland. But Vercingetorix knew that facing Caesar in a head-on battle would be a deadly mistake, would be suicide. So he retreated from Caesar's troops and scorched the earth on his retreat, making Caesar's troops follow him because he was attacking camp after camp and they needed Caesar and his troops support. But following through scorched earth meant that Caesar and his troops literally had to march through hell. And in fact, this chase on scorched earth was so hellish that at almost 50 years old, Caesar had to join his troops in the vanguard on the many skirmishes that happened along the way, join them in the vanguard, sword in hand, blood on his armor, battling and all, at over 50 years old, no, sorry, at almost 50 years old, to boost their morale. And it worked, because Caesar's troops made it through the chase and eventually his legions chased the Vercingetorix army or rather caught up with them at the city of Alesia, a strategic stronghold that only an idiot would dare to attack once the enemy is taking hold of it. And Caesar is not an idiot. So the Roman army laid siege to the city to starve them out. That is actually what Vercingetorix wanted, because he had long sent for reinforcements to attack the Romans from behind, pinch them in, overwhelm them, and defeat them. That meant that Caesar could not attack the city, because that would be idiotic, and he could not starve them out. So what did he do? He had his men built a 10-mile fence around the city of Alesia to fence them in and entirely cut them off from supply lines. And then his army built another 14-mile fence around his own troops besieging the city to protect them from the incoming Gaul reinforcement forces. So when these Gaul reinforcements arrived, the Romans fought them from behind their own fence and used choke points to hold off the Gauls who had superior numbers. And while the battle was in full swing, Caesar sent a cavalry unit around the back to attack the Gauls from behind. And the Gauls actually thought that these cavalry units signaled a whole swarm of Roman legions that were coming to reinforce Caesar and his troops. So they panicked, the Gauls panicked and fled the battlefield, fooled by Caesar's deception. And with his backup gone, Vercingetorix knew his people and the city of Alesia were doomed. So he surrendered to Caesar after a defeat so devastating to such an epic display of genius that that surrender was forever immortalized in this painting. Caesar was him. If him is being the murderer of one million people, because when Caesar arrived in Gaul in 58 BCE, there had been roughly six million people living there, and by 50 BCE, one million of them had been killed, and another one million had been sold into slavery. Um, no, so just let that sink in for a moment. Still, for Rome, this was a great victory and word of his conquest of Gaul and defeat of Vercingetorix quickly made it back to the capital where, if there had been internet around at the time, Caesar would have broken it. So in 100 BCE, before Caesar, this was the Roman Republic. And now, in 50 BCE, after Caesar had finished his latest conquest, this was Rome now. The conquering of Gaul, the invasion of Britain, and the defeat and surrender of Vercingetorix were Caesar's magnum opus. And if this story had a happy ending, this would have been the key moment. But there was one problem. While Caesar was gone, Crassus 
had died while campaigning elsewhere. And with Crassus gone, the triumvirate, the power of three, the balance of three, was no more. And with that balance of power broken, Pompey seized as much control in Rome as he could while Caesar was away and Pompey lobbied against him. Remember how Caesar would have been up for prosecution for breaking laws as consul, but a lot of the laws he broke was a favor to Pompey? And remember how him, Pompey and Crassus agreed that Caesar was to have governorship for 10 years in Gaul so that he could conquer the territories, enrich himself and then return to run for consul again? Yeah, while Caesar was gone, Pompey turned serious snitch. He told everybody that Caesar had overextended his term as governor of Gaul, that he was conquering on taxpayers' money and sacrificing the lives of Roman soldiers against orders without permission, all for his own greed and excess, and basically Pompey painted Caesar as an enemy of Rome, all while Caesar was gone. Of course, Caesar had supporters in the city, but they were drowned out by Pompey and his supporters and word around Rome quickly became Caesar is a traitor, Caesar stole territories from Rome, Caesar is coming to attack us. This was a real Game of Thrones chess move right here from Pompey, I mean, snitch as hell, but well played, well played sir, because it ensured that when Caesar returns to Rome, he will be tried, punished, stripped of everything he accumulated on his campaigns, forced to turn it over to Rome, and most likely be executed. So, what was Caesar's response to all of this? He famously said, Alea iacta est. The die is cast. Oh, he was gonna come back to Rome, alright? Yeah, with his army with 10 legions, and that's 100,000 soldiers who have been fighting alongside Caesar for years, who would die for their general that had proven in battle that he would die for them. But Caesar was not going to back down from Pompey. He was bringing a war to old man Pompey and Rome. Except that this war was much more like a cold war than the previous civil wars that Rome was engulfed in. This war was more of a race against time. Should Caesar and his troops make it to Rome, Pompey would stand no chance. So Pompey ordered legions of troops from the Greek territories to return to Rome ASAP and stand by his side. And should they arrive in Rome before Caesar does, Caesar would not be able to defeat them, certainly not without burning down half of Rome and losing the support of the people in the process. Basically, whoever manages to get to Rome first will be the one to win this race to the throne of Rome. Caesar knew he would not be able to make it in time with his whole army, so what he did was have one legion split off and he let that legion personally marched on the double and on January 10th, 49 BCE, Caesar and his legion famously crossed the Rubicon into Roman territory, an act that symbolizes war against Rome, but also an act that meant that Caesar had beaten Pompey to the punch. Caesar is in Italy! What? Caesar is in Italy! So Pompey and his supporters fled the city. Rome belonged to Julius Caesar. Now there was just one more thing standing between Caesar and absolute power. Pompey and his powerful supporters from the Senate were still alive after fleeing the city. And two of those supporters are particularly noteworthy. Marcus Junius Brutus and Marcus Porcius Cato. Remember how I told you that Caesar was a DOW! DOW! Well, one of the many bones that this dog had in his collection was Servilia, the mother of Brutus and the half-sister of Cato. 
Now, it is still debated to this day whether Servilia had Brutus with another man or if he is the illegitimate child of Caesar, a child he might have had with Servilia in a teenage fling when he was about 14 or 15. Not an unusual age at the time to get someone pregnant, not back in ancient times, but really, we'll never know. All we know is that, due to his relationship with Brutus' mother, Caesar and Brutus were close. But Brutus was also close with his uncle Cato. Brutus was also a man of the Senate and Brutus was also a supporter of the Republic through and through. So Brutus was highly critical of Caesar seeking power for himself and highly critical of Caesar representing values that would doom the Republic and effectively turn it into an empire. To simplify, Brutus was against Caesar and stood with Pompey. And when Pompey fled, Brutus and Cato were two of the supporters that fled Rome with him. So before Caesar could enjoy having taken over Rome and rule it, he had to take care of Pompey because he knew he would come back to fight him. That meant that in 49 BCE, shortly after his return, Caesar left his best general and good friend Marcus Antonius aka Mark Antony in charge of Rome while Caesar took his troops to Greece where he laid the smack down on Pompey. I mean, to be fair, not easily. They fought twice and Caesar lost once, but Caesar won the decisive battle so decisively that Pompey fled to Egypt. And what did Caesar do? He chased Pompey to Egypt, and when he finally got there, <laughs> Pompey had already been beheaded. <coughs> had chopped off, and they were like, yo, it's Caesar. Hey, here's Pompey's head. But let me rewind a little bit. Why did they do that? And what was going on in Egypt? At the time, and the time is 48 BCE, by the way, Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemy dynasty, a dynasty that started when one of Alexander the Great's generals took over Egypt. You might know this dynasty best as the one that Cleopatra belongs to. Man, that's why this video is such a name-dropping video, it's just like Cleopatra, you know, I'm just dropping these big names, right? Yeah, Cleopatra appears now. And currently though, Cleopatra was an exile, not a queen. Kind of a queen, but a queen in exile. And the one actually in charge of Egypt was her 13-year-old brother, Pharaoh Ptolemy XIII. And when Pompey arrived in Egypt, Pharaoh Puberty XIII wasn't about to show hospitality to a man that was being chased down by Caesar. Even here in Egypt, people knew of the greatness and ruthlessness of Gaius Julius Caesar, and he was not somebody you want barreling down on your country angry. So Pharaoh Puberty XIII had Pompey beheaded. And when Caesar got there, he proudly presented Pompey's severed head to him as a welcoming present. And Caesar was pissed. Shame on the house of Ptolemies for such barbarity. Shame. But you are enemies. He was a consul of Rome! A consul of Rome. Says I was actually chasing Pompey down to tell him that he forgives him and wanted to offer him a position in the Senate. He came to tell him that he had already forgiven all of Pompey's supporters, including Brutus, and also reinstated their position in the Senate. So he was not happy at all that Pompey was dead and was mad mad at Ptolemy the 13th. And remember how I just said Cleopatra was in exile? Yeah, she was beefing with her brother too. It was a whole weird thing about how her brother was married to her when she was, well, no, sorry, when he was 11 and she was like 19. It's weird. How funny you look in father's chair. They were beefing. She was exiled, and once exiled Cleopatra got word from her spies that her brother had started beef with Caesar. Cleopatra had herself smuggled into Caesar's camp, wrapped 
and a rug. Like, seriously, she wrapped herself in a rug and had that prime delivery sent straight to Cesar's place in Alexandria, Egypt, where when 51-year-old Julius Cesar unrolled the rug, ta-da! Beautiful 21-year-old Cleopatra, ready to do some seducing and scheming. She convinced Caesar to overthrow her brother and install her as pharaoh. A pharaoh that would always be on Rome's side, supply the republic with food, always pay taxes on time, and also a pharaoh that would get sweaty with Caesar. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because Egypt is hot. You know what I mean? I say that because they had sex. Man, these jokes are so stupid. Oh. So, Simpus Julius Caesar did as Cleopatra asked and casually started a civil war in Egypt in 47 BCE and defeated Ptolemy XIII's troops at the Battle of the Nile, where once again, despite being over 50 years old, Caesar was not some old man sitting back but actively part of the battle. His ship actually capsized in the fight and Caesar swam to shore during the battle while Ptolemy the 13th ship was also sunk during the battle but he, the pharaoh, drowned at sea. Caesar won. Caesar went to war for Cleopatra and won. So Egypt was hers while she was his. And so Simpus Julius decided to stay in Egypt with the new pharaoh for a couple more months for some loving. And rumors in Rome started to spread. While Caesar was away, Antonius, Mark Antony, and Caesar's other supporters pulled some strings to have Caesar appointed as sole dictator. And now the man they had just elected was in Egypt getting it on with a foreigner? To make it worse, when Caesar did finally return to Rome in 46 BCE, he brought Cleopatra with him? That, 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 that is blasphemous! But it's okay, because Caesar is still a badass who on his way back to Rome casually made a stop at the Bosporan Kingdom to defeat King Pharnaces II in five hours. A defeat so easy that Caesar then dropped one of the coldest quotes ever. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Though it should really uh, be, I came, I saw, I won. I won at the end, but <laughs> semantics. So now Caesar was seriously and fully in charge of Rome. And again, if this were to have a happy ending, this would have been the last stop to get on that happy ending train. Remember Pompey's supporters that Caesar forgave? I mentioned two, there were a couple, there were a lot in fact, but remember Brutus, who may or may not have been the son Caesar had with his old flame Servilia? Yeah, Caesar not only forgave Brutus for siding with Pompey, but during Caesar's battles with Pompey, Julius Caesar went out of his way to ensure that no one would harm Brutus. And now, Brutus was one of the main guys plotting against Caesar. Ungrateful little snitch. Caesar bringing along Cleopatra was the perfect controversy to exaggerate, so Brutus and the other Pompey supporter snitches spread the word that Caesar had a son with Cleopatra and was a traitor to Rome. Rumors that Caesar of course denied, but it didn't have the Cleopatra name the son he denied, Ptolemy the 15th, Caesar, aka nickname Caesar. Like, girl, read the room. <laughs> to the Caesar haters, this union with Cleopatra was proof that he was planning to weaken the Roman bloodline and rule over the Egyptian territories. It was proof that Caesar was simply out for total domination for his own ego, his own good. And when Caesar was appointed dictator perpetu, dictator for life in 44 BCE, their fears peaked. This was the last straw. Brutus and his kin agreed. Caesar had to be stopped or what little is left of the Republic would be gone forever and Rome would serve at the whims of Julius Caesar. 
So the little ungrateful Pompey supporting traitor snitches and togas decided that Caesar had to die and they set up a fake meeting fittingly in the Curia of Pompeii at the entrance of the theater of Pompeii where they planned to murder Caesar. And on the morning Gaius Julius Caesar was set to attend that meeting, his wife Calpurnia, oh yeah, he, by the way, he remarried and had a wife, but you know, Down! on the night of the fateful meeting, Calpurnia had a bad dream and told Caesar not to attend because she had a feeling that something might happen to him. Supposedly, this is truly what happened. And just as Caesar was about to listen to his wife, guess who convinced him to go and attend the meeting? Brutus. The man whose life Caesar saved. The man he forgave. The man who may or may not have been his firstborn son. Brutus convinced him to attend the meeting where Caesar was handed a document to inspect before 60 cowards and togas crowded him and assassinated him with 23 stab wounds on March 15, 44 BCE. And though we will never truly know Caesar's last words, nor if there even were any, Shakespeare famously interpreted them to be et tu brute and with his last breath Caesar covered his own face with his toga because he could not bear to stare into the eyes of the man who delivered the final and fatal blow killing Julius Caesar by stabbing him in the groin. Brutus Genghis Khan, you know the name of this feared conqueror. Red hair, green eyes, tall, strong, Khan of the Mongols. You probably heard legends of his violence, but do you know what a Mongol invasion really looked like during Genghis Khan's peak? The Mongol horde, well over a hundred thousand riders, would ride up on your city on so many horses you'd think an earthquake is coming. So you would hide behind your city's walls, but the Mongols would besiege your city and catapult pots of highly flammable liquids over your city walls and they would follow that up with hundreds of arrow launchers constantly firing 20 foot arrows into your city, many of them on fire, so that if you're not skewered by one, you're probably burning to death. And if you're not burning to death, then you can enjoy the hundreds of catapults that the Mongols are using to fling the heads of war prisoners into your city, the heads of your friends, your family, your children's heads. Meanwhile, the Mongol army would slowly march on your walls, but their front line would be entirely made up of war prisoners, your fellow soldiers, your brothers, your sister, your wife, your son, your daughter. That's who you're shooting arrows at first, from on top of your walls, before you even get the chance to shoot a single arrow at a single Mongol warrior. Your own people, your loved ones are then forced to man the battering rams that are breaching your gates, and they are the ones forced to set up the thousands of letters that the tens of thousands of Mongols would used to climb into your city where they will slaughter everyone and rape those they don't. And when it's all said and done and your city surrenders what's left of it, Genghis Khan will order his men to count all the survivors, men, women, and children, round them up and then he will give each of his soldiers a number of people they have to kill over the next couple of days in order to fully eradicate your city from the face of the earth. That's what you were in for when Chinggis Khan and his horde attacked. That's how Chinggis Khan was able to set the foundation for the largest land empire the world has ever seen. Because of that fear, many just handed over their cities or countries rather than face the wrath of the great Khan, a man so violent that he did this scene from Game of Thrones in real life. I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we get to how Genghis Khan killed 10% of the world population or raped so many women that one in 200 people today are his descendants, before we do all that, let's start with how a baby boy was born into nothing and built his great empire all on his own.
Let's address the red hair and green eyes thing first, because I feel like that's a shocker for some of you. Fair hair and fair eyes aren't common in Mongolia or its greater area, but it's also not all that unheard of. And the thing is, we don't really know what Chinggis Khan looked like because there were no portraits of the man allowed simply so that he couldn't be assassinated. But the one surviving report that is non-biased that we do have states that he had reddish, fair hair and green eyes. You know, so a little bit more torment and a little less Karl Drogo. But chill out, white supremacists, before you get all excited about whitewashing more history and have Chris Hemsworth play him, bro. Chinggis Khan still had Asian features. I know some of the people now get excited like, damn, we might have to give Chinggis Khan a better nickname, make him one of the good mass murderers, you know, like Alexander the Great or the Christians. <laughs> Yeah, man, nothing like a little bit of controversial, lighthearted social commentary to start the video. But side note, I'm probably still going to have some artwork in this video with him having dark hair just because his appearance is highly disputed and I want to cover all my bases. So, birth. Let's start there. Oriental Thor was born in 1162, and it would be a while before he would be known as Chinggis Khan. Right now, at the moment of his birth, he was just Timuchin, and his father was the ruler of a Mongol clan at the time, a time where Mongolia was not united at all and actually consisted of a bunch of clans, many of which were in conflict with one another really living that wild life, which is why the big fancy neighbor China actually called Mongolia the barbarian wildlands and built a wall at their border to keep those savages out. It's basically the same situation as Game of Thrones with the wall and the wildlings, you know? So this was the world Timujin was born into. And all this infighting also led to his father being poisoned by an opposing clan when Timujin was just nine years young. And despite being the son of the fallen leader, Timujin, his mother and the siblings and their closest associates were abandoned by the clan. Basically like Khaleesi after Karl Drogo dies, but also on some real Khaleesi thing, fellow fair-haired Timujin rose from a nobody to a somebody and his transition into a badass also started with the death of his brother. At 14 years young, Timujin killed his half-brother. Not for no reason either, man. Timujin's abandoned camp at the time was starving and this brother of his was hoarding food and he stole a fish from Timujin and so Timujin killed an arrow. That was his first kill. So one down, 39,999,909 to go. And over the next couple of years, Timujin grew into the leader of this camp of his and turned it from a camp barely surviving in the wild into a clan under his leadership. He made some alliances with other tribes and became blood brothers with another clan leader named Jamuka. And since Mongolian blood brothers would share like a blanket in the same bed, which was a normal custom at the time, some modern interpretations claim that Jamukka and Timujin were lovers, because, you know, sharing a bed, having like a wedding-like ceremony to celebrate your blood brotherhood, and later Timujin's wife was super jealous of Jamukka and Timujin's friendship. It, the, 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 the signs are there and it points towards them being lovers. It's very unlikely that they were, but hey, even if they were. Man, everyone's gay once in a while. So with Jamuka at his side, Timujin found himself at the head of an army of 5,000 men. And it was time to find a wife. And a wedding is also an opportunity to grow the clan further. So Timujin honored an arranged marriage that his father had set up years prior. Timujin married Berthe. And for their honeymoon, Berthe was kidnapped and raped by Timujin's enemies. Yeah, listen, if you're new to this channel, whenever you expect a story to turn into something blissful, expect a bomb to drop. Now, we're talking about a guy that when he was 12, killed his brother for stealing fish. What do you think he did when somebody stole his wife? Bro, Timujin called on his alliances and he and his 5,000 men rode into the lands of the men who took his wife. And what he did there? I should say, remember when Anakin killed an entire camp of Tuscan raiders? I killed them all, and not just the men, but the women, and the children too. That's literally what Timujin did. My man's body count was rising rapidly, but unfortunately, 
his wife's body count had also risen. But uh, had been repeatedly raped by the enemy clan and was now pregnant. Meaning that Timujin's first son was actually not his own. Which is ironic for a guy that will go on to rape so many women and have so many children that today about 20 million-ish people are direct descendants of him. <laughs> Karma. I don't know. I don't know what that is, but that's something. So with this serious first taste of blood and power under his belt, Timujin kept on conquering other clans in Mongolia. And he did that with ferocity. To understand the talent that Timujin had for violence, allow me to lean on my guy Christopher Walken and just imagine that he's talking about Timujin in this clip. A man can be an artist in anything, food, whatever. It depends on how good he is at it. Creasy's art is dead. He's about to paint his masterpiece. Timmy Jean's violent conquest scared half the other tribes into just joining his rule without a fight. And over the years, Timmy Jean built his following up to 200,000. He was a rising star. And that eventually put a strain on his friendship with Jamuka. Coming from nothing, Timmy Jean believed in a meritocracy, where one's value is not determined by one's birth, but by one's talent you know, by merit. Jamuka, on the other hand, believed in an aristocracy and the divide between the two best friends grew so large that the blood brothers split their clan in two. Team self-made men who were led by Timujin and team trust fund babies led by Jamuka. At first, the two new clans coexisted in peace, but being the two biggest clans in Mongolia where everybody is constantly fighting, conflict was inevitable. And the spark for that conflict was one of Timujin's men killing Jamuka's actual brother over the theft of some cattle. So Jamuka's response was to launch a surprise attack on Timujin's settlements where he killed many of his people and took some of Timujin's generals prisoner and boiled them alive so that their spirit was ruined and they could not enter the afterlife. You soon find out that drastic overreactions to a single person's death and also extremely violent punishments match just the Mongol way. So Timujin suffered his first taste of defeat and this loss, this embarrassment at the hands of his former best friend is basically where Timujin had his rocky moment and was just like, It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Timmy Jin leveled up. He built his army back up, whipped them into shape, and turned them into the legendary Mongol horseback warrior riding killers. We now know, riding for miles every day, sleeping while riding on their horses, living off of horse milk, and thus able to cover insane distances without being slowed down by rations or cooks, shooting off their horses' backs with insane accuracy for 500 yards. Timujin's army was it, and consisted entirely of a cavalry. They were way ahead of any other army at the time, and in terms of speed, efficiency, combat ability, and ferocity, forget about it. They were so elite that even China took notice and hired Timujin and his men as mercenaries. This army, this machine of slaughter, was ready to get revenge on Jamuka. So when they fought again, they whooped the army of Timujin's former blood brother and when Jamuka ran away from the battle to another clan for shelter, Timujin took 80,000 of his men and rolled over that other sheltering clan as well, chasing Jamuka into seeking refuge at yet another Mongolian clan and they weren't about to invite Timujin's wrath to their front door so their generals were like, uh huh, Jamuka bro, they wrapped that dude up and turned him right over back to Timujin in order to trade for their safety. So Timujin boiled those traitor generals alive because they're traitors and Timujin does not like traitors and they do not deserve to enter the afterlife. <laughs> yeah, that backfired. And Jamuka? Timujin still had love for his former best friend and gave Jamuka a chance to renew their blood brotherhood and for him to join his ranks. But my man, Jamuka, 
Jamuka refused, preferred to keep his honor intact and demanded, demanded to be executed. In respect of Jamuka's giant balls that were said to have filled the whole tent when these negotiations took place, Timujin honored him and killed Jamuka without shedding any blood. That was a whole thing back in the day. You know, you kill honored people without shedding any blood. And that sounds super poetic at first until you find out that that killing without shedding any blood was Timujin having him killed by having his spine uh, snapped. <laughs> no blood spilled. <laughs> Bro, winning. My man is walking up in the afterlife like, hey, yo. <laughs> no spine, just with his walker. Hey, yo. <laughs> what party at? So now, with the defeat of his best friend in 1206, 35 years after his father's death, at the age of 44, Timujin had united all of Mongolia and became the ruler of all the Mongols and thus he was given a title that translates to universal ruler. He was given the title Genghis Khan. And this was only the beginning of the legacy we remember today. So now our favorite red-headed, green-eyed Mongol is sitting pretty as a ruler of a unified Mongolia. And since he used to do some mercenary work for China, remember back in the day, he knew that a suddenly unified neighbor isn't going to be in China's interest. So he wanted to make the first move, you know, as a united Mongolia. He sent a peace envoy to the Jin Empire, which ruled parts of China at the time, to initiate peace talks. So. China, the Jin Empire, they killed the envoy. <laughs> Remember how I told you when how Mongols don't take so well to someone killing one of their people? Remember how Mongols mastered the art of bringing a gun to a knife fight? And remember how this is the guy who kills someone for taking a fish from him? <laughs> Yeah, China pissed off the wrong guy, bro. <laughs> Upon hearing the news that his peace envoy got killed, Genghis Khan disappeared in his tent for three days, fasted for three days, then came out that thing like, well, shit, I guess I'm gonna have to end the Jin dynasty. And he kind of did that. In 1211, Genghis Khan invaded Jin China, which of course had their wall, to keep out the Mongols, and they thought that they were safe behind that wall, but Genghis Khan had an army entirely made up of cavalry, so with that speed, with that ability to cover distances, they just went around the wall. From going around the wall to then simply absorbing the mercenaries that were sent to stop him into his own army, Genghis Khan was unstoppable. Even high city walls could not stop his nomad army, which should have been absolutely stumped by these high brick walls coming from tent living in the grass. But Genghis Khan was more than just a brute. He was a smart tactician. He knew how to learn from his enemies. So on his raids throughout China, Genghis Khan took Chinese siege engineers prisoner and they were now part of his army and he simply had them come up with siege weaponry to help Genghis Khan invade their own city. In 1215, Genghis Khan then came knocking on the walls of Chengdu, then the capital of the Chinese Jin Dynasty, now better known as Beijing. And boy! Then people of Chengdu were hiding while the big bad wolf was huffing and puffing against their walls. The Mongols laid siege to the city for a year and they were in no hurry. They cut off the supply lines so that the people of Chengdu starved. Genghis Khan's army was patiently building that siege weaponry and after a year, they sacked the city, slaughtered the starved and weakened Chengdu army and then pillaged and raided and murdered and raped all over the city for a whole entire month. And the message was clear. Genghis Khan could not be stopped. And you don't say no to him. And you certainly do not kill his envoys. So the next target on Genghis Khan's hit list said no to him and killed his envoys. <laughs> and in response, bruh, Genghis Khan wiped out a whole empire from the face of the earth.
The Chavez Masha Empire was located between China and Europe and it was at its time considered the greatest power in the Muslim world and it contained major parts of the Silk Road which Genghis Khan wanted to bring under his control entirely so that he could better facilitate trade between the Mongol Empire, the Islamic lands and Europe because all that trade on that Silk Road man that was money in Genghis Khan's bank you get me. Ching, ching. Paid over here. So good relations with the trading nation of Otrar, located within the Chavarez Masha Empire, were in Chinggis Khan's interest. And so in 1218, Chinggis Khan sent a Mongol trading caravan to Otrar. At the time, the city was governed by a man named Inalchak. And Inalchak didn't feel like engaging in trade with the Mongols, and he had the caravan slaughtered. Nobody knows why, but there could be many reasons, resentment of the Mongols or fear of them smuggling spies into the kingdom, who knows? Both are valid reasons, after everything I just told you about their siege and war practices, can you blame anyone for resenting the Mongols? And the fear of spies, that was legit, because Chinggis Khan would constantly send tactical spies into lands he wished to conquer or where he had interests, and he had the spies find out what's what in the city, you know, get in on the gossip amongst the nobles and use that drama to spread lies to divide the city psychologically and create inner turmoil to then make it easier to conquer. It was a literal Game of Thrones of the time. So whatever reason the governor of Otrach in Alchak had to slaughter the Mongol caravan, it could well be justified. But the slaughter meant that only one writer returned to Chinggis Khan to report that his trading efforts ended in blood. And you know, <laughs> at this point, how my guy reacts, right? But actually this time, at this stage in his life, Genghis Khan kind of wanted to avoid war these days. He just preferred to have his reputation, the reputation of violence and the fear it inspired. He wanted that to get the job done. And Genghis Khan actually sent back three more diplomats, two Mongol diplomats and one Muslim diplomat. Though this time, they went straight to the Shah of the Khavarez Masha Empire, Muhammad II, and they demanded with urgency that Inalchak must be punished for what he did for killing a Mongol caravan. And of course, the Shah Muhammad had heard of what happens when you oppose the Mongols, and he was a reasonable man. So he beheaded the Muslim diplomat and disrespectfully cut off the sacred beard of the other two Mongol diplomats and sent them back. AKA he was letting Genghis Khan know. Just bring it, bitch! So Genghis Khan decided, yeah, I'm gonna bring it. And he ended the entire empire. And when I say empire, I mean empire. The Khavarez Masha Empire had been ruling over vast areas of lands for 150 years and it covered an area of around 3 million square meters, which for reference, that's five times the size of France. And Genghis Khan decided he would end it all. Burn it all to the ground, wipe it off the face of the earth. And then he literally did that in two years, city by city. And every one of those cities could look forward to the siege scenario I outlined in the beginning of the video to shooting at their own wife, friends and kids being marched in the front lines to being sacked, raped, slaughtered and somehow probably even worse things. So some of these cities within the Khavarez Masha Empire were rightfully terrified when they heard the Mongol army was approaching but the disrespect of the Shah and Inalchak could not be redeemed. So even when generals or soldiers of the besieged cities defected or helped the Mongols sack their own city in return for mercy, Genghis Khan had the cowardly traitors executed and still sacked the city. And many times he then had his soldiers count the city's survivors, men, women and children, round them up and gave each of his soldiers a quota of humans to execute to make sure the punishment is absolute. If you look up no chill in the dictionary, you'll find a picture of Chinggis Khan. As for Inalchak, the man who set this whole thing in motion by slaughtering the Mongol caravan, Chinggis Khan gave specific orders to his army that Inalchak was not to be harmed until the Khan himself got his hands on him. And when Chinggis Khan did get his hands on him, he poured melted silver in Inalchak's eyes, mouth and ears no chill and you know what 
Before all this went down, Chinggis Khan had actually sent the Shah Muhammad a letter, a letter that read, I am master of the lands of the rising sun, while you rule those of the setting sun. Let us conclude a firm treaty of friendship and peace. And then they had to go and give his diplomats an unwanted chafe. <laughs> Shame. These conflicts give you an idea of what Chinggis Khan was about in a nutshell, and how this man was able to establish the foundations of an empire that later became larger, way larger than the Roman Empire ever was. A foundation of fear, because anyone who refused to join was wiped off the face of the earth by Genghis Khan's superior army and then served an example of extreme cruelty that in turn scared others into just flat out joining the empire. That's how the Mongol Empire started under Genghis Khan and reaching its territorial peak under his grandson Kublai Khan became the largest land empire ever. And still, Genghis Khan was just a man and he died like any other man with a woman biting his dick off. Genghis Khan died on August 12th, 1227, and we don't know why. Some say a woman killed him, some say she did that by biting his junk off or by castrating him when he forced himself on her. Some say that that's just a modern fairy tale and he really died of malaria. Some say he fell off his horse and later died due to his injuries, but the fact is, we don't know. But the even crazier fact is that we still don't know where Genghis Khan is actually buried 800 years later and we have no clue. And the thing that makes this exciting is that he was buried with a lot of treasure. So if you're gonna talk about a real life One Piece, bruh, that's literally Genghis Khan's grave. Bruh, when the man was buried, 30,000 people were involved in his funeral procedures and all 30,000 people were killed or killed themselves to take the secret of his grave to not to 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 their grave <laughs> that's the dopest thing ever i mean supposedly an entire river was redirected over his grave which would explain why 30,000 people were involved in his funeral and why his grave still has not been found but Either way, yo, that's the most One Piece, Uncharted, Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider, coolest thing I've ever heard. And if this does not make you go, I'm gonna find that grave. Now, I don't know if you have a sense of adventure, because I'm gonna find that grave. And while his final resting ground is disputed, Genghis Khan's last words are not. They were, with heaven's aid, I have conquered for you a large empire but my life was too short to take the whole world that i leave to you <laughs> oh, that's so epic <laughs> that's so epic and that marks the ending of a life that caused a lot of bloodshed but also did a lot more than that while he was an absolute demon to all those who opposed him within the mongol empire Genghis khan did good and he had some positive, everlasting influence on the rest of the world too, on today's world even. Within the Mongol Empire, women had more progressive rights than in a lot of other places at the time. They could divorce and their men were expected to listen to them. And in fact, men were so expected to listen to their woman that it was common for a man to marry an older woman since she was then considered wiser and able to give advise and guide him and men that didn't listen to their women were not respected and i say women plural in the last one there because they still m were married to several women but only the first woman was considered the main the others were like side chicks with the difference being that only the first woman would inherit the man's wealth and once he was dead most of them did die because like, bro they were conquering 24 7. did you hear that they slept on horses you know what i mean like most of them did die and once the man was dead the woman was the head of the household and was not forced to marry again and if the husband didn't perform his duties in the bedroom a woman could take him to court and get a mandate to make him lay the pipe down <laughs> i'm not i'm not kidding the Mongols also introduced the first form of a passport for trader safety, which made the Silk Road flourish. And it is said that throughout the Mongol Empire, which at its peak 
was 24 million square kilometers. That's five times bigger than the Roman Empire, and that's 17% of the entire planet's land mass covered by the Mongol Empire. It was said that during the time of the Mongol Empire, one could wander this entire Mongol Empire land mass with a plate of gold on their head and not worry. The Mongols also established a postal system with fresh horses at every stop, allowing riders to cover 200 miles a day. They created a set of laws that every citizen had to abide by and that was as progressive as banning slavery and wife kidnapping. Well, slavery of Mongols, but at least one form of slavery was banned. The Mongols also famously had a meritocracy, meaning it didn't matter who you were born as, it only mattered what you brought to the table. Anyone could rise to the ranks anywhere in the Mongol Empire, even enemies, if they proved merit and loyalty. I mean, respected enemies that Chinggis Khan fought became generals in his army later on because he was just like, bro, you can fight, <laughs> you know? As long as you showed loyalty to the Mongol Empire and accepted Chinggis Khan as the ruler, you were kind of good. You were even allowed to practice any religion. The Mongols even supported other religions with tax exemptions for places of worship and Genghis Khan himself, on some real Ragnar Lothbrok thing, often consulted with leaders from various other religions to learn their ways. So was Genghis Khan evil? Let me answer that question with a question. Was Alexander the Great evil? No? Let's just say that at the end of the day, the Avengers would come for both Genghis Khan and Alexander. And at the time, more than today, the line between good and evil greatly depended on which side of the line you were standing on. Take Alexander the Great. The Persians still hate the man, and rightfully so. And to the Mongols, Chinggis Khan is a hero, and it makes perfect sense from their point of view. One man's terrorist can be another man's freedom fighter. And in our westernized world, if you plunder from west to east, you're great, like Alexander. If you do the same from east to west, you're a barbarian, like Chinggis. And with that in mind, let's get excited about the next episode in this series. Napoleon Bonaparte. Let's start this video with an important fact. My man was not short. I repeat, Napoleon was not short. Napoleon was five foot six, which is exactly the height of this guy. For his era, Napoleon's height was perfectly average, if not slightly above average, and this whole Napoleon is short with a big head and small hands thing was just genius propaganda by his enemies to counteract the fear that Napoleon inspired all across Europe. If you're wondering how much fear that was, later writers went on to call Napoleon Bonaparte the god of war. <laughs> Enough said. But, but 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 I still have like things to say for like over 30 minutes, so not 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 enough said. Please keep watching. All of Europe feared Napoleon because Napoleon clapped everybody's cheeks, and not only once, neither man. This guy won the title, the rematch, and the rematch is rematch, and the rematch is rematch. You get the point. Bonaparte was the undisputed pound for pound boss of Europe and made all the other kings his sons. So let's do a full biography on Papa Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on August 15, 1769 in Corsica, which had just been taken over by the French. Napoleon has seven siblings and his anime anti-hero arc really only starts once he enrolled at the Royal Military School of Brienne Le Chateau at age 9. If you watched any shonen anime ever, you've seen this before. Kid enrolls in fancy school, gets bullied because he's broke and talks weird, so he becomes a loner who is obsessed with studying conquerors and war tactics, which is weird, so he gets bullied even more because they're like, why are you studying, nerd? But he takes the beating knowing he will one day dominate them all. It's really a bulletproof blueprint for making a great hero or villain, but... Don't try it in real life because it's also a bulletproof blueprint for severe depression. <laughs> Instead of suicide thoughts though, Napoleon took a page out of Naruto's book and had dreams of one day being in charge. But 
reality check, bro. Real life is not an anime, and friends at the time was ruled by the rich. Dreams might get you far in fiction, but in real life, it's not like some random event will suddenly completely shake up the status quo, which allows a lowborn from outside of France to rise in power purely based on the merit of his bravery and talent. <laughs> Except that's exactly, literally what happened. The French Revolution happened. The French were tired of being ruled by the monarchs and their favoritism for the nobles. They were pissed for many complex reasons, but to put it simply and into something we can all relate to, the rich didn't have to pay taxes. Only the poor did. That meant that when French kings, the inbred Louis kings, conveniently numbered so you know their level of inbreeding, like Louis XIV, built Versailles, a place with 700 rooms that cost the equivalent of $2 billion today, the poor had to pay for it. So the poor decided that they'd rather chop the king's head off. And in 1793, four years into the revolution, the 16th inbred Louis lived up to his nickname Louis Le Dernier, Louis the Last, because he got his head chopped off and his wife Marie Antoinette got her head chopped off too later in the year. Finally the evil oppressive rule of the monarchy was over and France was a republic that belonged to the people. Finally France could enter an era of absolute chaos. <laughs> Unprecedented chaos, madness, death and misery, all of that bad stuff followed because bro the revolutionaries were like the dog chasing the car. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. They had no idea what to do with France now that they got their hands on it. Sure, they labeled it La Première République, but other than that, their only plan was to kill everybody that even entertained the idea of bringing the monarchy back and spoke up against this new republic. The former revolutionaries became the new government of the republic in an era that has since been called the Reign of Terror, highlighted by 40,000 people who were beheaded or died in prison just in the span of a year. After the monarchy was abolished, France was in chaos. But Napoleon knew chaos is a ladder. It's not that Napoleon was a revolutionary or necessarily cared about France or the people all that much. Napoleon cared only about Napoleon having power. And this whole down with the elites thing that France had going on really worked in his favor. So he embraced the new French Republic, kissed some Republican ass, and by 1793, at age 23, Napoleon was made an artillery captain, aka the new dog for the new government to hunt down the remaining royalists, those who wanted the old Louis monarchy back. Now, quick fact check here because this is getting kind of complicated. We have the monarchy of inbred numbered Louis who ruled France for centuries, right? We have the revolution who ended the monarchy and turned France into a republic, so they were the new republican government, and so the defeated monarchy supporters were now royalist rebels who were hunted down. That's all within France. You with me? All of this was a problem for the rest of Europe, the other European countries, because they all were monarchies where the rich are living their best life by exploiting the poor. Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia were the main guys who were not down with France going through their rebellious phase. They didn't want none of this French Revolution smoke. They didn't need uprisings all over Europe to undermine their privileged rule. So the monarchs took issue and became a good old monarch fraternity against France. Just remember this so you know the fronts in and outside of France, alright? The bond between monarchs and general monarchy fanboys was in fact so strong that French royalists supported the British monarchy trying to invade France to reinstate the French monarchy, yeah? And this is where we come back to the newly minted Captain Napoleon, who was given the task to clap some royalist cheeks. In the harbor town of Toulon, French royalists had opened the ports for the British. That was the problem. Napoleon's cheek clapping mission was the solution. Mind you, at this point, Napoleon was an absolute virgin in the art of clapping cheeks, so I'd like to think my guy was kind of nervous when him and his troops fought the British and the French royalists at the harbors of Toulon. But Napoleon popped his cherry successfully. All cheeks were clapped thoroughly. Ten British ships were burned, the rest of the British retreated, and the Republican government knew exactly what to do with the French royalist traitors. Chop, chop.
But Napoleon didn't just win that battle. <laughs> no, he won with crappy troops that he whipped into shape. He won with crappy troops that he whipped into shape and let into battle himself. He won after he had his horse shot dead under him after bayonet slashed him. Napoleon still successfully clapped cheeks against all odds. So now, Napoleon was the go-to clapper for whenever royalists were acting up. And it just so happened that royalists were kind of planning a new coup d'etat. That's fancy French for saying they wanted to overthrow the new government, the new republic that had just been formed. They wanted another numerically designated inbred Louis. So the republic sent supreme clapper Bonaparte to stop all that uprising nonsense. And Napoleon whooped all the royalists in France and thus stopped the civil war that was about to escalate and as a reward, Napoleon Bonaparte was made commander of the Army of the Interior in 1796 at just 27 years young, a title that would set up a new assignment. Clap cheeks internationally. Italy was calling. So while all this trouble was going on within France, they also had trouble at their borders. Because I repeat, the other monarchies in Europe really disliked the whole beheading kings and queens thing France had going on and wanted to set an example that this type of stuff does not fly. So the French threw the chopped off heads around to show that this type of stuff does indeed fly. <laughs> Oh, that was a bad joke. The rest of Europe did not recognize France in any way, and Les Enfants de la Patrie came under fire from all borders. And one of those borders was Italy, where the Austrians had set up shop and fought the French for years. A real slow jam battle that the French were losing, and after years, their army was malnourished not motivated and just a bunch of scrubs really. So when this new 27 year old commander Napoleon arrived at the scene talking about clapping Austrian cheeks to some Italian tunes, the military veterans laughed at him like, what's he gonna change after years of- So Napoleon won the war in two weeks. Bruh. I'm telling you, this guy was on some real Braveheart thing when it came to motivating and leading troops. Man was all like, immortality, take it. It's yours! Just so you understand, Napoleon winning with this army was like LeBron dragging the crappy Cleveland roster to a championship. The French won thanks to the pure genius of Napoleon and his bravery of actually joining them at the front lines. Napoleon outmaneuvered the Austrians at every turn with speed and splitting the enemy army up into smaller fractions by cutting off supply lines, forcing them into battles where his cavalry and his soldiers just blitzed them. So after arriving on the scene and within two weeks changing a year-long losing war campaign into a winning campaign, there was a snowball effect. And Napoleon continued to steamroll and use his genius maneuvers and high-paced warfare to take more territory from the European monarchies who were trying to bully France, Italy, Austria, and North Africa. <laughs> yeah, I know North Africa must be like, what do you say fuck me for? I know they're not European, but the reason Napoleon campaigned through North Africa was because France was locked in a stalemate with the British forces elsewhere. And the British had some things going on in Egypt, so Monsieur Bonaparte visiting Egypt was an attempt to tip the war in France's favor. Also, Napoleon was quickly rising in popularity, and when he won those battles all over Europe, he himself signed treaties with the losers and carved up the lands. He had no business doing that. That's like LeBron being the coach and Le GM and the actual head coach and GM feeling like an idiot. That was not Napoleon's role. So Egypt was a good way for the French government to keep Napoleon at arm's length and to stop him from getting too many MVP and coach of the year votes. You get me. But Napoleon used Egypt to his advantage. For him, it was a way to follow in the footsteps of his idols, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar by, well, by literally following in their footsteps because well, they used to be in Egypt too. That was kind of poorly phrased. I think we should... Poorly 
he's sleeping. I was going to say, should we cut that? But he's sleeping. He's so cute. In 1798, Napoleon traveled to Egypt with a bunch of scholars and set up a science institute. And then he sent back a bunch of publications to France about how he's doing these amazing things in Egypt and discovering all this cool and ancient stuff and how he's setting up French interests. He even had himself painted touching plague victims in Egypt, like he's healing them like some kind of god, which of course he thought he was. And all of that was a bluff, because on the military side of things, it wasn't going well for Napoleon in Egypt. The British were not happy with this unscheduled visit and destroyed his fleet at the harbor. And on land, the British teamed up with the Ottomans and gave Napoleon's troops hell. It got so bad that Napoleon wanted out of Egypt. Egypt was turning into a waste of time for him, and he was losing his precious momentum. He wanted to return to France to use his conquering momentum, so he abandoned his troops and his post in Egypt and returned home, where thanks to his genius propaganda, Egypt was a roaring success for Napoleon. Because that's all the people back home in France heard and cared about. So when he returned to Paris, people were like, And Napoleon was like, I'm him! I'm him! Only to find out that his wife had cheated on him while he was gone. Look, here's a guy who basically ascended to godlike status in his country and literally made his country bigger, literally, and his wife still cheats on him. It just goes to show that it's not the size of your country that matters. You get me? Also, his wife, Josephine, was kind of known to belong to the streets, but Napoleon had married her because she was hot and she had status. Fair enough. And it's not like he wasn't cheating on her too, but still, Napoleon went through a sad mixtape phase, wrote a sad letter about her cheating that the British then intercepted and published to embarrass him and push the propaganda of Napoleon being the short, big-headed, soft, bumbling fool. But for now, Napoleon had to climb the ladder of chaos in France, which was in absolute chaos. Divided and on the brink of civil war, years later, life without the monarch still wasn't what it was advertised to be. Way too many heads were rolling, people were starving, there was thieving, there was poverty, there was chaos, no structure, no security. It was bad. Enter Napoleon Bonaparte, fresh off of conquering land and some epic Egypt propaganda, even though that was a failure, the people loved him. He was the people's champ, loved by the millions and millions. So Napoleon had an idea. Hey, salut, bonjour, bonjour, ça va, ça va, yeah, ça va. Uh, I have an idea. Let's like overthrow the government and do a new government headed by three consuls. <laughs> Maybe I should be one of them. You know, just one, just one of three. Not like I'm ruling, just on the trois, one of three. <laughs> but maybe I should be the first of the three consuls. There's three, but I'm first. All consuls are equals, of course, but I'm more equal. <laughs> Egalité. So basically, Napoleon hijacked the coup d'etat that was already in the works before he even returned to France. He was originally just meant to be the military guy used for his popularity to help the boring nerd politicians who actually came up with the coup d'etat take control. But Napoleon was so popular that he just pushed the boring nerd politicians into irrelevance. And in 1799, he became the first consul of what in theory was a consulate of three people ruling France, but in reality, it was just Napoleon. So with Napoleon in charge, a lot of things changed. He fixed the ruined economy by establishing the Bank of France. He made secondary education free, which further undermined the power of the elites. And he promoted people based on merit, no matter their status. Napoleon also turned the messy laws that were all over the place and no one cared about into the Code Napoleon, a civil code. And now all men were equal before the law, which finally brought safety and stability back to France. All in all, Napoleon brought a level of conservative leadership back and he also brought back slavery to the French colonies and decided that women don't really need any of those civil rights, <laughs> they're better off being the property of men. I'm not kidding, that's actually true. He really set them back. Evil tanks say he was salty because his wife cheated on him. Uh, we'll never really know. So this is France right now, right? Solid for the Frenchmen, not so much for the slaves and the women. But Napoleon was like, eh, good enough, and rode off again, back to fight his favorite country to beat up on, Austria. 
The second Napoleon went back to France to set women back for decades, the monarch fraternity of Europe helped Austria take back all the land Napoleon had conquered. And I repeat that because it's important. They took it back immediately after he left. This was a theme throughout Napoleon's reign. He couldn't be everywhere at once, and everywhere Napoleon was, he was victorious. But everywhere he wasn't, well, he wasn't. The Austrians got all confident again all of a sudden and forgot about their sore cheeks that had Napoleon slapped all over them. And Napoleon knew he had to send them a little reminder. So he rallied his troops. Guys, let's do a road trip. Alps, how about that, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's the year 1800. New century, new me. That's what they say, right? So let's pack it up. On y va. We gotta clap some Austrian cheeks. <laughs> again. Napoleon brought an entourage of 40,000 men across the Alps in six days. And then his troops delivered a cheek clapping of such ferocity that the Austrians signed a peace treaty which gave Napoleon even more territory and basically made him Don Europe Napoleon, first of his name, Clapper Supreme. That was his official title. You can Google that. So recap, in 1792, Napoleon was made captain and this was France's territory then. And this was France now in 1803 after Napoleon clapped cheeks and took names all over Europe. And this was a problem for the British because they didn't sign up for this guy taking over all of Europe. They wanted to chill French inbred Louis monarchs back that were like them. And they were so done with the République. So they declared war on France in 1803 and on Europe just said, challenge? Accepté. And Napoleon went on to invade Britain and obviously the only way to do that is over water, you know, since, I mean, that's how islands works. But the British Navy was strong, too strong. Napoleon might have been undefeated on land, but in the water, he was a fish out of water. <laughs> Wait, that, that, no, that doesn't work. In the water, Napoleon was like us black guys, out of his element. He lost big time at this sea battle against the British that became known as the Battle of Trafalgar. But... That was okay, because when Napoleon returned to Paris, he was still able to spin the story and make it all about him being undefeated on European land. So Napoleon returned to France, whose territory was bigger than ever. Now, it was only right that he would drop the charade of France being ruled by three consuls and just made it official, took the stage, and told all of France, I'm the captain now. Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France on December 2nd, 1804. Literally crowned himself. I mean, the Pope was there and was going to put the crown on Napoleon's head, but Napoleon took that thing from him and was like, get out of here. I'm going to crown myself Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Don Europe, first of his name, Clapper Supreme. At 35, he was the Emperor of France. No pressure, but I'm turning 34 <laughs> next year. <laughs> Even though he was the emperor now, Napoleon was not one to sit idle and get fat. Nah, man, they didn't call him God of War for nothing. Exactly one year after his coronation, Napoleon went back on another war campaign. This time he took his wife Josephine with him because now that he's emperor, he can't have her messing around. Plus, she didn't exactly have any civil rights anymore, so it's not like she could complain or refuse. Napoleon left for yet another battle. And if this was a movie, I call this bad writing, but I'm serious. He fought against the Austrians. Again. Once again, the Austrians did the ancient equivalent of calling your brothers for backup. They asked around the monarch fraternity, and this time Russia answered their call and agreed to be their backup. But you already know how this one ends. The Austrians facing Napoleon is like Team Rocket trying to stunt on Ash. Napoleon sent them packing at the famed Battle of Austerlitz, where he abandoned a strategically advantageous war position on purpose to bait the enemy into an attack, only to counterattack them with speed, divide the enemy forces, and defeat them to take even more land from them. Classic Napoleon. This guy could not be stopped. And to summarize Napoleon's battle with the Austrian Empire, Austria got whooped by Napoleon in Italy in two weeks, then he crossed the Alps in six days to whoop them again. Then they pulled the I'm getting my big brother's card and still got whooped. That is why to this day, we still call all Austrians the sons of Napoleon. <laughs>
So now that he dispelled all doubts about who Austria's daddy is, Emperor Don Europe Napoleon, first of his name, Clapper of Cheeks, father of Austria, figured it was time to really lay his meat on the table and make Europe his once and for all. It was time to conquer Russia. Before he took his troops to Russia, Napoleon returned to Paris and cashed in on his cheating freebie. He had a baby with Eleonore Denuel de la Plaine, and I'm not just telling you that for no reason, because him and Josephine had been trying to have a baby for years, and Napoleon thought that maybe his little general was firing blanks, but now that Napoleon knew he was able to produce offspring just fine and it wasn't him, but it was Josephine, he divorced Josephine. Supposedly. They separated in love, knowing it was important for the emperor to have an official male heir within the sanctity of marriage. So Josephine was out and Napoleon married Marie Louise, the daughter of, <laughs> wait for it, the daughter of the emperor of Austria. <laughs> when, when I tell you, Napoleon took everything Austria had to offer. So, to celebrate this new marriage and show his love to his new wife, Napoleon decided it was time for a honeymoon in Russia without his wife. Also, not a honeymoon at all, but a war campaign without his wife in Russia. Napoleon left for the Russian war. In 1812, Napoleon took his biggest army yet into Russia. 650,000 men assembled from all his territories. Taking over Russia would complete his conquest of Europe. Except for the British, but we don't care about islands because we don't like water around here. This was going to be the end game and 650,000 men marched into Russia. Less than 100,000 returned. Russia was a complete disaster for Napoleon. The Russians had learned that when Napoleon wants to fight, you don't fight. They knew his advantage was speed, so they just ran away from him and scorched the earth to slow his army down on their trek through Russia. This took away Napoleon's speed and the battles he fought against the Russians on his way to Moscow were dragged out fights against an army that was retreating into safety while Napoleon's army was following them living off of scorched earth, starving, exhausted and decimated by the time they reached Moscow. With only 130,000 men, Napoleon marched into Moscow and then the Russians basically just abandoned the city and burned it. Napoleon found nothing of value here, but he was convinced that the Russians would now come and fight for their prized city and that he could defeat them in a battle in Moscow, but they didn't. They didn't fight, they just left him waiting in Russia, waiting for a fight that never came, but what did come was the Russian winter. And Napoleon was stuck in a burned down Moscow with his road back home being equally burned down scorched earth. He was trapped. This was a real problem. Winter in Russia was cold as hell and unforgiving and the road home had nothing to give of value. Napoleon had made a major tactical error and had to retreat in a hurry if he wanted any of his troops to survive. And the Russians knew that. So on his retreat, they attacked the French troops here and there and things got so bad that Napoleon eventually carried poison with him, ready to end his life rather than being captured. But in the end, he survived and he returned home, as I said, with less than 100,000 men. But still, his army was beaten and broken for the first time. But the first time was all the European monarch fraternity needed. They kicked Napoleon while he was down, obviously. And in the Battle of Leipzig that followed, Napoleon gathered up the rest of his army and allies, making it close to 200,000 men that were fighting against the 300,000 men on the side of the Austrian, Prussian, Russian and Swedish allied troops. The Battle of Nations in Leipzig. Half a million people going at it. All those who had previously been beaten by Napoleon were out to finally defeat their now wounded nemesis. And they did. The clapper had become the clappy. Emperor Don Europe, Napoleon, first of his name, Supreme Clapper, father of Austria, was no more. His own country turned on Napoleon and he was forced to abdicate. That's a fancy word for saying he had to give up the throne, by the way. I remember when I was a kid, I had to look that word up and I hated it. Napoleon was sent into exile on the island of Elba and that was the end of Napoleon's reign.
Except that after 10 months of exile, Napoleon was like, nah, fam, let me single-handedly conquer France and become emperor again. And he did that. <laughs> Back in France, Louis, the inbred number 18, was in charge and life was back to being what it was like before the revolution ever took place. France was kind of a monarchy again and the rest of the European monarchies were happy. So imagine everyone's face when they heard Napoleon escaped his exile and was back in Paris like, surprise bitches. Big Daddy Bonaparte was back and this time he was the rebel and this is like what? the third rebellion in France now over the last 20 years? Whatever. Napoleon marched his little rebel army through France and King Louis was confident he could end Napoleon's rebellion before it ever really starts. So Louis XVIII sent the royal army to confront Napoleon with bad intentions and confront Napoleon with bad intentions they did. But my guy just stood there and Napoleon was like, he's gonna do it then. He's gonna kill me. When I tell you he literally convinced them all on the spot to defect from the royal army and join his now growing rebel army, fam, bruv, Napoleon took back the throne without firing a single shot. The people were on the side, the army was on the side, and soon Napoleon's rebellion grew so big that there were no royal supporters left and the inbred king number 18 had to flee the country. Napoleon was back, back in charge of France, and the rest of Europe was just like, are you fucking kidding me? We just exiled this guy. Fuck. Yeah, he's back. Start up the propaganda machine, make him even shorter. So the European monarch fraternity got back together and this time they didn't even declare war on France. No, this time they specifically declared war against Napoleon Bonaparte, a bunch of monarchies teaming up and specifically declaring war against the one man that threatened everything they stood for. That's gangster, man. <laughs> I can't lie, man. Napoleon, that's gangster. Hell, even the French monarch Louis XVIII joined the monarch fraternity and declared war on Napoleon and joined the fight. You know, but in a kind of useless way. Kind of like Batman when Superman and Wonder Woman fought Doomsday. So it all had to end in a battle for the future of Europe. And that battle was at Waterloo. June 18th, 1815, 72,000 French under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte fought against the British, Dutch, Belgian and German allied forces. 68,000 men under the command of the Duke of Wellington with support of 45,000 Prussians. A battle that's really worth its own video, but the gist is that Napoleon's army wasn't much of an army anymore. They were young, inexperienced conscripts. He had no cavalry to execute his trademark high-speed warfare. Napoleon was once again LeBron James dragging a crappy team into battle. Except this time, he was not prime LeBron. He was old man LeBron. And in the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon made tactical mistakes. This 45-year-old Bonaparte who had overcome exile and retook his country was exhausted and finally beaten by his enemies for good. Napoleon lost at Waterloo. After 100 days back in power, Napoleon had to give up the throne again, this time for good. And he was exiled to Saint Helena. And when I say exiled, I mean exiled for real this time. Saint Helena is here. Bro, they were so done with Napoleon, they exiled him to the end of the world and had ships patrolling the island to make sure Napoleon never escapes again. And Bonaparte lived out the rest of his life on the island until he died at the age of 51 in 1821. And his supposed last words were, to die is nothing, but to live defeated and without glory is to die every day. That's a bit dramatic, but it sounds cool. Yeah, I get it, I get it. 